It's great to be here. I, uh, I am always happy to come and speak about my sort of odd obsessions. Um, in fact, I probably shouldn't say before I'm paid, but I would be happy to speak about them for free on almost any occasion, actually. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's kind of how obsessed I am with these things. Um, so what I wanted to talk about today is something that I'm calling uh, the prosthetic littoral. Um, and I guess the, the first question, if I throw that out as the topic, would be, what is the prosthetic littoral? Um, well, by that I mean the interface between land and water, um, between uh, sediment, uh, sediment and water, um, as it is constructed by an array of technological instruments. Um, so things as simple and humble as a sandbag, um, an erosion control fence, um, Although when you take those symbol and humble things, in this case a turbidity curtain, and repeat them and aggregate them, they tend to become much larger. Um, even so large, for instance, uh, as, as a dredge material containment facility where one of these instruments expands to be the size of an entire landscape in and of itself. Um, sometimes they're very hard, uh, things like concrete tetrapods, um, sometimes they're much softer, kind of wrapping the skin of the earth, as in this case, um, a geogrid. Um, or uh, a kind of wet bag, uh, in this case, a, a geotube, which is sort of like a sandbag, but blown up to a much larger scale, often used for dewatering, as here, or for um, kind of constructing, in this case, a series of dams uh, constructed with geotubes and geotextiles. Um, I think there's something very, uh, for me at least, uh, this is kind of where my odd obsession comes from, um, from thinking that there's something very strange and beautiful about these landscapes um, that maybe hasn't been noticed as much as it could be or should be. Um, one of the few people who I think has really taken the time to observe and pay attention to and um, kind of explain these landscapes is the Japanese photographer Toshio Shibata who took this photograph, um, where you see these kind of soft structures um, wrapping the earth and kind of uh, covering it like a body. Um, th this also happens with some of the, the harder things, like for instance, in this case, um, concrete revetments on the Mississippi River, um, which are laid in place by this uh, rather odd large scale, maybe uh, sort of a proto 3D printer here um, called the mat sinking unit employed by the US Army Corps of Engineers. Um, which takes these concrete mattresses, which are cast at this place, St. Francisville Casting Fields, and lays them along the banks of the Mississippi River. Um, so there are many of these kinds of instruments, but for me, uh, the, the most uh, intense and visceral uh, of these kind of technological instruments are the, the tools used in dredging. Um, so dredging, uh, very simply, very straightforwardly, is when you either suck or scrape sediment off of the bottom of some water body um, and you deposit it or dispose of it in some other place. So it's this kind of linear industrial process that involves removal, transport, and disposal. Um, I think when you take all of this machinery, all these technological instruments, um, pull this whole array together, uh, you start to see something emerging, or at least my colleagues and I in the Dredge Research Collaborative um, have seen this thing that we, we think of as, as a dredge cycle, a kind of anthropogenic counterpart to or anthropogenic analog to um, natural geological cycles like the rock cycle or the water cycle, um, something which is um, composed both of this kind of accelerated erosion um, as well as um, decelerations like the construction of the dams that Michael talked about. Um, and then, then moments of uh, forced uplift, places where uh, sediments, um, rather than being powered by gravity, become powered by the input of human energy. Um, dredging, I think, is kind of the switching point between those two things, between the accelerated erosion um, and between forced uplift, uh, where you kind of uh, have a pause in this cycle. Um, this is usually the point where I like to talk about uh, kind of the scale of human, uh, human earth moving, um, but Michael has done that so well 
that I felt like I could, I could abbreviate this a great bit. Um, and so I'll just throw two, two separate things at you. Um, one being uh, the kind of, in the United States, the, it has been calculated that um, geologic or natural erosion produces about 30% of the total sediment uh, that moves uh, within the country, well as, whereas accelerated soil erosion from human use produces about 70%. Um, so these kind of moments within the dredge cycle are actually not uh, aberrations at this point, but rather they're kind of the normal. They're the, the new uh, kind of standard condition of sedimentary movement. Um, and there's also, there's a geologist uh, named Roger Hook um, who did this series of calculations about uh, human earth moving per capita. Uh, and so he took kind of an extrapolation from different technological tools and different ways, uh, whether that's through agriculture or deforestation or mining, um, that humans intentionally and unintentionally moved Earth over history. Um, and you get one of these graphs, one of these, they're, called, they're often called hockey stick graphs, kind of the most famous hockey stick graph would be um, the, the kind of temperature graph um, that you've probably often seen. Um, but in this case, you have Earth moving per capita very flat throughout the majority of history until you enter the last 100, 200 years, um, and then suddenly uh, Earth move per capita shoots upward from zero tons per year per person um, up to over 30 tons per year per person, at least for the United States. Um, <clears throat> and then taking that a step further and not looking per capita, but at kind of the total sum population of the Earth, the graph continues to flatten, becomes an even more extreme hockey stick uh, because of the enormous growth in population. Um, and you see that both intentional and unintentional earth moving um, have in the last, uh, really the last uh, 50, 60, 70 years um, rapidly accelerated um, so that we're kind of living in this new and bizarre world in which um, the prosthetic littoral is perhaps the normal littoral. Um, Scientists talk about this in terms of the great acceleration, this idea that um, that time period, kind of starting around 1950, marks uh, a massive acceleration in human activity and large-scale changes in the Earth system. Um, so that's kind of what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about prosthetic landscapes, prosthetic littoral landscapes in this time of acceleration, a bit about uh, the scale that they have as individual landscapes as opposed to um, collective global scale, um, their strangeness, and a bit of what I see as their potential because um, as a landscape architect, as a designer, um, there's a kind of uh, certain optimism that I want to have about the ability to uh, rethink and reimagine the things that we're doing to the surface of the earth. Um, so the first place that I want to take you to uh, is Jamaica Bay. Um, Jamaica Bay is in New York Harbor. Um, it's, uh, it's a bit southeast of Manhattan, between Brooklyn and the Rockaways. Um, but in order to understand what's happening in Jamaica Bay um, and how it relates to these questions about the prosthetic littoral, uh, we actually need to start in Panama, um, so quite, quite far south of Jamaica Bay. Um, the, the country of Panama, uh, which uh, recently repossessed the Panama Canal from the United States, um, uh, a, in 2006 um, started this new construction project called the Panama Canal Expansion, um, which is doubling the size of the Panama Canal, or doubling its capacity. Um, there's enormous kind of extent to the, the, the pure earthworks involved um, in this construction project. Um, it involves deepening and widening of entrance channels, um, approach channels, uh, the channel through Gatun Lake. Um, it involves raising, actually, the, uh, the water level of Gatun Lake, which is itself uh, in an artificial construction um, by 18 inches. Uh, it involves uh, the construction of new locks on both the Pacific and Atlantic sides. Um, so an enormous amount of earth moving um, in terms of volume, uh, I think it's, it's about 130 uh, million cubic meters of earth that are being moved uh, in order to uh, accomplish this expansion. Um, it's about half, a little more than half of what was moved in the original construction of the Panama Canal. 
Um, it's more than the amount of earth moved to construct the Three Gorges Dam. It's more than the amount of earth moved to construct the Suez Canal. It's a, it's a phenomenal amount of earth for a single um, construction project. Um, and all of this excavation, all of this construction um, is really in response to kind of uh, a shift in the logistical playing field that the Panama Canal operates within. Um, so that um, in the last, uh, or recent decades, I guess, it has had an erosion of its competitive advantages compared to its two primary competitors, um, which are the Suez Canal um, and the U.S. intermodal system, the U.S. intermodal system being uh, kind of road and rail routes between the Pacific coast of the United States and uh, the heartland and the East Coast. Um, this erosion uh, has been um, uh, produced by a shift in the specifications of the largest ships that ply the oceans, the largest ocean-going commercial vessels. Um, uh, historically, or at least uh, through the bulk of the 20th century, the largest ships were what were called Panamax ships. And these were literally um, ships whose depth and width uh, specifications were determined on the basis of their capacity to fit through the locks of the Panama Canal. So they would, they would fit with, um, I think actually less than a meter to spare on either side um, through the canal, uh, and that was kind of a Panamax ship. Um, in recent decades, um, post-Panamax ships, ships too large to fit through the Panama Canal, have become much more prevalent, they're more efficient, um, it's cheaper to ship goods on them, uh, and because the, those Pacific Coast ports for the intermodal system, um, because the Suez Canal, uh, are both able to accommodate these post-Panamax ships, um, shipping has kind of been moving away from the Panama Canal and towards these two other routes. Um, so the, the Panama Canal expansion is intended to create a new Panamax, a Panamax which will accommodate these much larger vessels. Um, and at the same time that uh, that, that kind of earth moving is happening in the Panama, uh, Panamanian Isthmus itself, there's also a much larger, uh, we might call it like an engineering shockwave that's emanating outward from the canal up and down um, the both Pacific and Atlantic coasts of North and South America, um, where many of the ports um, are preparing themselves for the arrival of these new and larger ships. Um, if we zoom into North America and then to the East Coast and the Gulf Coast of North America, um, almost all of the major ports, the ports shown here, um, are engaged in a process of expansion themselves in order to accommodate these new ships. Um, so they're dredging, um, <clears throat> they're depositing the sedimentary surplus from that dredging and building new islands. Um, they're engaged in direct port expansion, meaning the addition of new larger cranes that can accommodate post-Panamax ships, new berths, um, and they're expanding intermodal facilities. So they're enlarging their capacity to um, take containers off of ships uh, and put them onto rail and road links to the interiors of countries. Um, this shockwave uh, hit New York Harbor perhaps um, earliest of any of the North American ports. Um, and so New York Harbor has been uh, engaged um, for over a decade now in a program of infrastructural upgrades like that. Um, they've been raising bridges in order to accommodate the larger air draft of post-Panamax vessels, um, and they've been doing dredging, lots and lots of dredging. Um, and this dredging uh, is particularly important in this case uh, because of the kind of unintended effects of that dredging or the, the things that that dredging has unintentionally enabled. Um, so if we look, um, as I did a few years ago in making this map, um, at uh, maintenance dredging in New York Harbor. Maintenance dredging is uh, the kind of dredging that's required on an annual basis um, simply to maintain the current depths of navigational channels. Um, here the navigational channels uh, are the kind of um, yellow and orange, um, and then the, the sites at which that sediment is moved to um, are these uh, kind of black icons. Um, this is maintenance dredging from about 2009 to 2012. Um, in the same period, expansion dredging by volume is much greater. There's a much greater uh, kind of amount of sediment involved in deepening um, the channels in order to accommodate these new vessels 
um, than there is uh, in the purely ordinary maintenance dredging. So there's this kind of sudden um, sedimentary surplus much beyond what's ordinarily found um, within the New York Harbor area. Um, the, in addition to the kind of quantitative difference between those two kinds of dredging, there's also a qualitative difference. Um, so the sediment that's typically found in maintenance dredging is uh, kind of highly contaminated. Um, it's often filled with toxins from industrial sites. Uh, there's agricultural runoff involved, um, pollutants from, uh, from roadways. Uh, and so it has historically been sent to what's called the mud dump site. And it's this kind of um, strange underwater island um, of deposited dredge uh, found in uh, a water body known as the New York Bight, which is um, sort of outside of New York Harbor uh, in the deeper portion of the ocean. Um, but the, the, the sand that's being removed through expansion dredging, um, while sometimes also contaminated, is frequently much cleaner um, because it's coming from uh, channels which have, or kind of uh, underwater sediments which have not been previously disturbed. Uh, and so, so its cleanliness makes it suitable um, actually for beach restoration or environmental restoration. Um, and so uh, this is what brings us back to Jamaica Bay. Um, Jamaica Bay uh, is characterized by, um, historically by a series of marsh islands at the center of the bay. Um, these marsh islands suffered kind of uh, an alarmingly rapid um, collapse over the course of the 20th century. They lost about um, half of their total land mass in the 20th century, uh, and it was predicted at the turn of the 20th century that they would lose um, the remaining 50% of their land mass in the first two decades of the 21st century. Um, the expansion dredging for the Panama Canal construction um, has led to um, kind of an opportunity that the Army Corps of Engineers, the entity which is responsible for that dredging, um, saw to link this sedimentary excess to that sedimentary deficit in Jamaica Bay um, and engage in a program of Marsh Island restoration, uh, a bit of prosthetic restoration. Um, uh, so um, suddenly, instead of being a story of loss, um, the story of the uh, islands in Jamaica Bay um, is a story of a very rapid um, and somewhat strange uh, recreation. Um, I think that particularly the strangest thing about it uh, is that the Army Corps um, is very insistent about only depositing sand within the historic outline of those previous islands. So even though many of those islands had in fact completely disappeared, um, they are only willing to rebuild them exactly where they were when they were mapped, say in 1930 or so. Um, so it's kind of a strange recollection of a previous moment um, in an otherwise shifting and dynamic environment. Um, but what I think is really uh, interesting there is kind of the unpredictability of that, the fact that who would have guessed um, that the expansion of the Panama Canal would lead to the opportunity to restore a series of marsh islands in Jamaica Bay. Um, and I think this is something that's kind of telling uh, about um, conditions within the prosthetic littoral, that often um, the most fecund or fertile opportunities um, are these opportunities which are found within the excesses generated by our own uh, kind of uh, industrial operations. Um, the second place that I want to take you to um, is Craney Island. Um, Craney Island uh, is in the state of Virginia, so it's a little bit um, further south along the eastern coast of the United States from Jamaica Bay. Um, it's in the estuary of the James River, um, and it's in a, a kind of um, a portion of that water body referred to as Hampton Roads. There are kind of seven different cities here, all of which are uh, more or less port cities. Um, so it, it's, it's home to what's known as the Port of Virginia, um, the primary port for that state. Um, and Craney Island, uh, is the dredged material containment facility that I showed a bit earlier. Um, it's the place where um, the majority of the sediment which is dredged out of the navigational channels for those ports is placed. Um, it's also enormous. Um, so it, uh, it's composed of three cells. Each of these cells is the same size uh, as um, Central Park in New York City. Um, and, 
and is uh, almost entirely featureless uh, when seen on the ground. Um, so these are kind of enormous flat expanses. Um, on the, the previous slide, I, I had this idea that, that what we're seeing here in Craney Island is a machine. Um, so if Craney Island is a machine, um, what is it a machine for and how does it work? Um, well, it starts with sediment being dredged out of those navigational channels. Um, that sediment is in a slurry, so it's in a mixture of water and sediment, um, which is actually piped. It's piped onto the island um, and it's piped into uh, the eastern part of one of those containment cells. Um, so it comes out of a pipe like this, lands on the island, um, and then it's sorted by gravity. So that slurry, uh, that mixture of water and sediment, the sediment within it um, is actually sorted by the very gentle slope of the island. It's, uh, it slopes only um, a couple meters over the course of this entire island. Um, and uh, as water from that slurry moves across the island, the heaviest particles, the sand, drops out first on the eastern side of the island, um, and the lighter particles, the silts and clays, drop out on the western part of the island. Um, close to these weirs, um, there are weirs on the western island part of the island. This is actually um, a photograph standing on one of those weirs, looking back to the east across um, the water body. Um, these weirs can be raised and lowered as needed. Um, they're mostly raised. Uh, because the island um, is always growing larger. It's always growing from this accumulation of sediments that are dumped on it. Um, these are two photographs uh, that I took in 2011 and 2013, so about two years apart. Um, they're of the backside of one of those weirs, um, and you can see that in those two years, um, the, the doorway, the, the original entrance into the weir um, was almost entirely covered. Um, the, the, the island is also kind of self-constructing um, in that um, the, the, the sand which is used to construct the walls of the levees that surround the cells actually comes from deposits on the island, so it's very helpful that it's been sorted by particle size, so they're able to go to certain parts of the island to find the kinds of sediments that they need in order to enlarge its own walls. Um, uh, and um, it also gives it, um, this process of sorting, gives it a very unique soil profile where soil profiles are kind of typically vertical. You might have the organic or O horizon at the, the kind of highest part of, of a soil profile and then as you go down it changes through a series of different soil horizons, the A, the B, the D, et cetera. Um, but on Craney Island, the soil is actually sorted horizontally. So it's sorted east to west, um, which is a very, strange um, and uh, not common condition um, from natural processes. Um, there's also a kind of uh, uh, industrial rhythm to the island. Um, uh, as I mentioned before, it's constructed out of three cells, um, and each of these cells goes through um, a three-year rotational cycle of activity and inactivity. Um, so each year, there's only a single cell in operation, and thus each cell um, operates for a year, then goes through two years of inactivity um, before it's brought back online. Um, these two things, this kind of combination of the unusual soil profile of the island um, uh, together with, with its industrial rhythm, um, have uh, given rise to uh, an extremely unusual arrangement of opportunistic ecologies, uh, where these uh, novel assemblages of plants and animals um, have colonized the island, um, but they've colonized it not on the basis of um, perhaps um, ordinary or natural associations of species, um, but rather in response to this um, industrial sorting of soil um, and this industrial rhythm that the place has to itself. Um, it's actually, it's become a very significant ecological resource um, for the area that, or the region that it's found within. Uh, it's an important part of the Eastern Flyway. Um, there are many migratory bird species who've come to depend on it um, and its isolation from mainland predators. Um, but all of that, again, kind of an unintended consequence um, of a series of earth moving practices. Um, and then the last place that I want to take you to um, is the Mississippi River Delta. Um, so the Mississippi River Delta is uh, on the Gulf Coast of the United States, um, so south again from Virginia and west as well a bit. 
Um, and if you've heard a story told about the Mississippi River Delta before, um, you've probably heard it told in terms of a contrast between the geologic mobility of the river and the infrastructural constraint of the river. Um, there's a lot of truth to this story. Um, if we start out thinking about geologic mobility, um, this comes um, first within the kind of floodplain of the river um, in terms of the meandering process. The fact that uh, over time, the river moves naturally as a result of um, deposition on its inner banks and erosion on its outer banks, um, which causes it to always be moving back and forth within its floodplain. Um, and then as you move down into the delta itself, so out of kind of the basin and into the delta, um, there's a, a, a switching process akin to what uh, Michael showed with the Yellow River, um, where uh, about every thousand years or so, um, the course of the river as it enters the Gulf of Mexico um, hops to a new location, it jumps to a new course. Um, this is called an avulsion. Um, and each new avulsion every thousand years uh, causes the construction of a new delta lobe. So the present state of the Mississippi River Delta, its present topography, its present terrain, um, is the result of the interaction of this land building process of avulsion, um, uh, interacting with the kind of erosive forces uh, of the gulf that it enters. Um, and the specific mechanism by which um, the river builds these new delta lobes um, is flooding. So uh, particularly during the springtime when the rains are heaviest, um, the river tends to, or at least through geologic history, has um, jumped its banks um, and carried in floodwaters great volumes of sediment. The sediment deposits out. Um, it forms the swamps, the marshes, the chenares um, of southern Louisiana. Um, as European and American settlers arrived in Louisiana, um, they discovered that it was very convenient to live along the Mississippi River. It was a great um, navigational resource. It gave them access to the um, entirety of the enormous Mississippi River Basin. Um, but uh, they also had to deal with this consistent flooding. Um, and this flooding was not uh, very conducive to the construction of permanent settlements. So over time, they began to enhance those natural levees. They began to build earthen levees. Um, they, <clears throat> in this case, one of them's blowing up. Um, but they, they began to build these earthen levees uh, in order to protect themselves um, from the floods. And this seemed to be fairly successful. So uh, settlement began to intensify uh, along the Mississippi River, both in Louisiana and further north. Um, this uh, kind of disastrously um, in 1928 became a significant problem um, when these newly constructed levees were unable to hold back um, what at that time was the largest flood uh, in kind of um, recently recorded history, the Great Flood of 1928. Um, and there was an enormous flooding throughout the basin. Um, thousands of people died. A great deal of property was destroyed. Um, and so the US Army Corps of Engineers, that organization again, um, was tasked with the responsibility of reconstructing the Mississippi River, of constraining it so that it would never threaten human settlement in its basin again. Um, and so this involved, this involved enlarging, um, strengthening, making taller the levees that existed along its banks, um, but it also involved uh, not only that kind of shift in scale, but also a shift in methodology of flood control. Um, so rather than purely trying to constrain the river to its banks with levees, um, they realized that it would be necessary at times to permit the river to leave its course and to flood into surrounding areas in specific controlled locations. And so they constructed a series of what are called floodways. Um, in Louisiana, there were two of these, the Morganza floodway and the Bonacars floodway. Um, and these floodways are controlled um, by these, these valves, these things called spillways, um, a Morganza spillway, a Bonacar spillway. Um, to give you a sense of their, their kind of scale and construction, um, this is a photograph on the ground um, just outside the Morganza spillway in 2014. Um, this is a photograph of the Morganza uh, spillway um, opening, just in the early stages of opening in 2011, which is the last time that it was opened. Um, this is the Bonacar spillway being opened uh, the same year, 2011, the same flood event. Um, and again, a sense of its scale 
Uh, this is kind of a social event. People come out to watch the spillway open, to watch these machines ride up and down the tracks and open the wooden gates. Um, there's also a third valve, a slightly different valve, um, called Old River Control. Um, so Old River Control is very, very literal. Um, it does exactly uh, what its name suggests it would do. Um, it controls the river and holds it in its old position. Um, so we are now well past that um, thousand year mark at which we're due for another avulsion. Um, and so uh, Old River Control exists to fix the current course of the Mississippi River um, and prevent it from switching into the Atchafalaya Basin, which is the basin that it actually, geologically speaking, wants to enter now. Um, so this is the point where the, the kind of standard story leaves you. Um, yeah, you, you have um, the idea that um, Louisiana, uh, the Mississippi River Delta, is um, kind of disrupted in terms of its land-making make, function. It's no longer capable of building land, um, and it's sinking into the sea as a result of that. Um, as a result of the inability of land, basing, land building processes to counter subsidence, to counter erosion, to counter saltwater intrusion, to counter sea level rise. Um, it leaves Louisiana in this kind of state of crisis where uh, in about 100 years it's projected um, that New Orleans, this major uh, city, uh, will be entirely flooded, entirely surrounded by the ocean. Um, but that story is also a little bit, uh, a little bit inadequate, um, in particular uh, because of the issue that Michael got at in terms of the scale of sediment um, held behind dams. Um, so there's, there's constraint at the scale of the delta, but there's also constraint at the scale of the entire basin. Um, the construction of um, hundreds of small dams, dozens of larger dams, um, all holding back sediment uh, within the basin. Um, and radically reducing the amount of sediment that travels down the river. So that at this point, um, uh, even if all of the constraint within the delta itself were removed, um, it's quite likely that there would not be enough sediment traveling down the river to um, maintain the delta in its existing state. Um, this has not gone unnoticed. Um, and so um, this kind of state of crisis is being responded to um, with what to me is um, one of the most interesting uh, kind of design projects in the world right now, the Louisiana Coastal Master Plan, um, which the idea of the master plan kind of suggests a, a direction or a, a, a singularity of, of thought and intention, um, but the Louisiana Coastal Master Plan is actually marked by its kind of uh, decision to throw everything at the Delta, um, to throw every possible uh, means of restoration that we can think of, um, not necessarily tested things, but including many untested things like sediment diversions, um, along with more tested practices like barrier island restoration or structural protection, um, and see if any of these practices will work. Are any of them capable of um, halting this process of land loss? Um, and it's also, again, kind of opportunistically um, being funded at an unprecedented scale um, as a result of um, damages from um, the BP BP Deepwater Horizon oil spill. So this enormous oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico that's led to an enormous slush fund of money um, which cannot be spent in any way other than coastal restoration. Um, and if it were legally possible to spend it any other way, I'm sure they would. Um, so this is kind of, this is the end of the talk. Um, this is everything I, I have to tell you about these three different places. Um, but it's actually, this is really the beginning point um, for my work uh, as a designer um, because the question for me uh, is uh, not just uh, kind of what exists within the prosthetic littoral, uh, but how can we rethink it? Um, uh, what kind of new valves, new machines, um, new feedbacks can we design? Thank you.